It happened at a place so desolate, a visitor once likened himself to an Arctic explorer. It lasted barely 12 seconds, just long enough for one mesmerized witness behind a camera to snap the only picture he would ever take. On December 17, 1903, two high school dropouts from Dayton, Ohio, taught the world how to fly. That was then, and I think is still today, the symbol of our ability to fly, our ability to overcome insurmountable problems. With that one photograph, now there was probably very little we weren't going to be able to do. If we could overcome the problem of flight, what else could we do? A century after that eventful moment, we've mastered what was once the standard for human impossibility. Every craft in our crowded stratosphere has one thing in common. Each can trace its origins to this revolutionary prototype. The Wright Flyer, enshrined in the Smithsonian Institution, was the first aircraft conceived with an understanding of the principles of flight. The principles applied to its design a hundred years ago remain unchanged. The two brothers who sent the century soaring were much more than tenacious bicycle mechanics. They were consummate self-taught experimenters who approached the problem of flight more methodically than any before them. The Wright brothers were born problem solvers. Their minds operated in such a way that they were very detailed, they were very focused, they worked with numbers and loved doing that. They were really the computer geeks of their day. These were two uh, kids who had grown up in a household that appreciated technology, that appreciated mechanical skills. Their social life is very, very limited, and they seem to have thrown all their energy then into their work. Wilbur and Orville's solemn work ethic came from their father, Milton, a bishop of the United Brethren Church. They owed their mechanical talent to their mother, Susan, a born tinkerer. As the boys grew up, their home in Dayton became a crucible of creativity. With their parents' permission, they often skipped school to pursue their own interests. Each developed a passion not for maidens, but machinery and both were destined to be lifelong bachelors. By 1899, they were prosperous partners in the booming bicycle trade. But seeking a supreme challenge, they resolved to realize mankind's age-old dream of flight. The Wright brothers began their quest to invent the airplane when the automobile was still a novelty. In 1899, the gasoline engine was barely a decade old and only 8,000 cars rolled on America's roads. Less than 3% of Americans lived in homes powered by electricity. Even fewer had a telephone. It was a Victorian world, burgeoning with technological promise. And the Wrights gained a new sense of purpose as they set out to unravel the greatest riddle of their time. Countless others had tried and failed, Some efforts were comical, others were catastrophic. But even as their dreams of flight came crashing back to Earth, they gained a firm grasp of the challenge. There was basically three things that needed to be solved to have a workable airplane. You needed wings to create lift. You needed an engine and propeller system to actually move the airplane forward so the wings could create lift. And most importantly, you needed to be able to control the vehicle. Control was flight's greatest unsolved mystery. In Germany, renowned engineer Otto Lilienthal made over 2,000 glider flights in search of the answer. He tried to remain stable or turn by shifting his weight. His pioneering research ended abruptly during one flight in 1896 when he plummeted 50 feet and was killed. Accidents like Lilienthal's convinced many that the only solution was to build a craft that was inherently stable in the air, minimizing the need for a pilot. 
The most prominent believer in this theory was Samuel Langley, the revered head of the Smithsonian Institution. In 1896, Langley launched the most successful miniature plane yet devised. It was powered by a steam engine and stayed aloft for 90 seconds before landing softly in the Potomac River. Langley envisioned a full-scale version that would be the first powered manned aircraft, a plane so stable that a pilot would just be along for the ride. As bicycle makers, the Wrights viewed the problem of control differently. The Wright brothers thought that a bicycle was inherently unstable, but it could be controlled. It was a matter of balance. They realized how important balance is and balance was the real secret when they started working on the airplane. Balancing a bicycle is very similar to balancing an early aircraft in flight, whereas the rider becomes one with the craft. In the case of the bicycle, a rider will continually adjust their weight from side to side, going into a turn, adjust their position of their hands and their arms and their legs. And in a similar way, the rights approach the problem of flight understanding that they would have to make constant, small adjustments to their aircraft. The Wright brothers' challenge was to devise a control system a pilot could operate to make those adjustments. Wilbur found the first piece of the puzzle hiding in plain sight, where those who dreamed of flight had been looking for centuries. Observing birds circling over Dayton, he felt certain they balanced and turned by twisting their wingtips. Flexing one tip up and the other down, they created different degrees of lift for each wing. This enabled them to keep their stability or bank to one side or the other. Wilbur's observation was revolutionary, but he still had to figure out how to mimic the trick in a flying machine. Inspiration hit at the bicycle shop as he shot the breeze with a customer. Wilbur was talking to him and he picked up an inner tube box and as he talked to the customer he began very absent-mindedly twisting the two ends of the box and suddenly he realized that what was happening with the box was the same thing that happened with the bird's wings and immediately he had an idea he said we should be able to replicate this in a wing on our machine to make it fly. The Wright brothers called their bold new concept wing warping. They set out to test their theory by building a five-foot biplane kite out of bamboo and paper. It had cords that ran from the wings that crossed to sticks that Wilbur held, and as he moved those sticks, the wings warped, and he was able to bank the kite. He was also able by moving the cords together to cause the kite to dive and to climb. Up until that time, no one really had control over the kites. It was just at the mercy of the wind. But here he was, he's able to make it descend and climb on command. This had to be amazing because now you were able to control this kite in flight any way you wanted to. The Wright's next challenge was to build a glider that a pilot could control just as adeptly. Since it would have no engine, they needed a test site with strong winds to generate a steady flow of air around its wings. 700 miles from Dayton, a remote village on the outer banks of North Carolina seemed ideal. Its sands promised soft landings, and its solitude ensured the secrecy the guarded rights demanded. Kitty Hawk would become a turn-of-the-century version of Area 51. September 1900. The Wright brothers' quest for flight began in a place so remote that no one in the closest town could tell them how to get there. Kitty Hawk was as obscure as the two bicycle makers who hoped to make history there. This was a wild, chaotic area at the turn of the century. Of course, this area behind us, uh, we see a lot of grass and trees uh, uh, today, but in 1902 and 3, um, it was devoid of grass and trees. Orville described this area as the Sahara. It was just a large dune field with four large sand dunes without a, a building or a tree, nothing that would impede the Wright brothers in their flights. 
The Wrights hope to take advantage of Kitty Hawk's constant winds aboard a larger version of their 1899 kite. The glider weighed 52 pounds and spanned 17 feet. The brothers crafted the wing ribs from ash and covered them with French sateen, a cotton fabric with a satin finish. Relying on the late Otto Lilienthal's research on lift and wing shapes, they designed a gentle curvature into the wing's upper surfaces. The glider's control system featured two elements. A forward-mounted elevator enabled the pilot to nose up or down, and the innovative wing warping system, which was linked to a foot-operated T-bar. In this fashion, by pushing with your feet, you could pull on the cables that would warp the wings. If you pushed back with your right foot, then that would warp the wings to help you turn to the right. And if you pushed with your left foot, then that would help you turn to the left. The Wrights began by flying the glider as a tethered kite, with lines running to the ground to operate the controls. The elevator uh, worked pretty good. The wings worked relatively well. But overall, they were kind of dismayed because it didn't seem to generate as much lift as it calculated out to be. They used all the uh, tables of the time based upon all the engineering knowledge at the time. And the thing just didn't generate as much lift as it should have. So that year, they were unable to really fly that glider as a true manned glider. At one point, they did enlist one of the local children, Tom Tate was his name, to get on the glider, and they flew it as a kite with him on board. And with him on board, uh, they could now calculate uh, the resistance of a seated body in their craft. So they did learn something while they were out here, uh, but the glider was really not very successful. After six weeks, Wilbur and Orville returned to Dayton to tend to their bicycle business and to design a new glider. They were confident that if they increased the size of the wings, it would produce the necessary lift. In the nation's capital, Samuel Langley was just as confident. His winged masterwork, called the Great Aerodrome, was taking shape. With engineer Charles Manley, he was busy designing a powerful engine he was certain held the key to its success. Undaunted by Langley's progress, the Wrights returned to Kitty Hawk in 1901. They assembled a new, larger glider in a hangar they erected themselves. Its wings were 22 feet long and seven feet wide, with a surface area almost double their original model. As they had done the year before, the Wrights began by flying the glider as a kite. Unlike any inventors before them, they chronicled every step of their progress, or lack of it, with photographs. The Wright brothers were fine amateur photographers, and we we're fortunate that they were because they documented everything that they did. They were afraid that people weren't going to believe them, and this was a way that they could have proof on film of what they were doing. On July 27, 1901, Wilbur piloted the new glider on its maiden test flights. Kitty Hawk's locals were impressed, but the Wrights were discouraged. Despite the increased wing area, there was no improvement in lift. And that wasn't their only setback. It did not seem to fly as well at all as the 1900 glider. Quite frankly speaking, the 1901 glider was a flying pig. It, it was a terrible flying machine compared to their anticipated performance. They suffer terrible problems with the control system. Uh, the control system doesn't work anywhere near as well as it had in 1900, particularly in terms of pitch, controlling the glider up and down. Turning the glider proved even more problematic. They found on occasion that as they uh, tried to roll the vehicle or maneuver it in a certain direction, uh, for example, making a right turn, all of a sudden they would find instead that the glider started to turn completely in the opposite direction. And this was a great puzzlement. Here I am in a right-hand turn, and all of a sudden the thing's going back to the left. Why is this happening? They really weren't sure. Wilbur's piloting skills made up for the glider's design flaws. He was able to stay airborne as long as 18 seconds, soaring as far as 400 feet. It was little consolation. They had broken almost every gliding record in the world, yet they considered that whole year to be a failure. They didn't have the lift they needed, and they didn't have the control that they needed. 
On the train ride back to Dayton at the end of that season in 1901, Wilbur turned to Orville and said, not within a thousand years will man fly. That was probably a really tough time for them to decide whether they should start all over and keep on going or whether they should just abandon this. Most others before them had folded up their wings and gone home. But the tenacious brothers would use a flimsy assemblage of bicycle spokes and hacksaw blades to help them go where no man had gone before. September, 1901. Two brothers named Wright never felt more wrong. Three years of flight experimentation had seemingly reached a dead end. The Wright brothers weren't quitters. It just wasn't in their genes. And they were doggedly determined to solve this problem. To go forward, the Wright brothers realized they really had to take a step back. Wilbur and Orville retraced their steps over the past three years and suspected where they had made their critical mistake. From the beginning, they had relied on the lift data compiled by the late great German engineer, Otto Lilienthal. His tables had been the key to how they designed the size and shape of their glider's wings. The Wrights now believed what other aeronautic pioneers would consider sacrilege, that Lilienthal's data was seriously flawed. To test their theory, the innovative brothers had to look no further than the inventory in their shop. The Wrights took a bicycle, and on the top, they mounted upon the handlebars a free rotating wheel. And on this wheel, the Wrights mounted a flat plate and a curved airfoil. And their idea was that if they rode into a strong headwind, that wheel with those foils on top of it should remain stationary in a strong wind, if Lilienthal's data was correct. However, the wheel on the handlebars did not remain stationary, and so they determined that indeed there was a problem somewhere in the tables of data. To find out for themselves what kind of wing produced the greatest lift, the Wrights built what others had conceived 30 years earlier, a wind tunnel. They crafted it from a wooden box that held laundry starch. Power was supplied by a one-cylinder gas engine used to run the bicycle shop's machine tools. It drove a fan that created a 23 mile per hour wind stream. Now you'll notice as you look into the wind tunnel, you've got some straighteners in here. Once you get past this X straightener, you have sort of a honeycomb. This would straighten the wind and give it a nice smooth flow all the way through. Now at the far end of the wind tunnel, the Wrights put a balance. That balance is how they measured lift. This balance was a very simple and crude affair. It was made of uh, old bicycle spokes and hacksaw blades, but they produced very accurate data. For each wind tunnel test, the Wrights vertically mounted a miniature wing or airfoil on the balance. Each airfoil had its own unique curvature and shape. Mounted near the airfoil was a series of flat plates with known values of drag. By carefully measuring the difference between the airfoil's effect on the airflow and that of the flat plates, the brothers could calculate the airfoil's lift. Over three months, they tested nearly 200 different airfoils. The Wrights, like all flight pioneers, knew that a wing produced lift by creating reduced air pressure above and increased pressure below. Their challenge was to discover which shape would create the greatest degree of lift. Up until that time, people knew that curved wings were much more efficient at generating lift than a flat plate was. The problem was is they were generally pretty symmetrical. The high point was right in the center. What they found was is that you really want to have the highest part about a third of the way back, not halfway or not way up front like they did on their 1901 and 1900 gliders. Armed with their breakthrough findings, the Wrights returned to Kitty Hawk in August 1902. They cannibalized their 1901 glider and crafted a new model. They not only modified the curvature of the airfoil, but made the wings 10 feet longer and two feet narrower. They also added a fixed vertical tail, reasoning that it would add to the glider's stability. 
Finally, the brothers re-examined the glider's control system. In the 1902 glider, the elevator worked the same way it did in the 1900 and 1901 glider. You had a bar that you held in your hand, and that moved the elevator up and down this way. They did make a fairly significant change in the wing warping in 1902. In 1900 and 1901, the wings had been warped by moving a foot bar back and forth, and the Wright brothers found this to be a very difficult and frustrating way to move the wings. So in 1902, they changed and went to the hip cradle. Now, when they wanted to warp the wings, they moved back and forth this way. They found this to be much simpler, and it gave them better overall control of the glider. During their first free glides, the Wrights discovered that the new craft's wings generated precisely the lift they had calculated. The new tail seemed to solve the problem of the glider reversing course during a turn, but a vexing new problem arose. At times, the glider slipped sideways, tipped on its low wing, and spun into the sand. Every flight seemed fraught with risk. In September 1902, the Wrights faced their closest brush with disaster. Orville was flying along, and the glider started to go out of control. It was pitching upwards, it was rolling to the side, and then it was turning about its own vertical axis. In brief, it went completely out of control. Orville stands up out of the wreckage, climbs out of it, brushes himself off. He is totally unscratched. He only has one small tear in his clothing. So he had a miraculous escape. But this did really drive home the point to him. There is something inherently wrong with this glider. At the Wright brothers' camp, it was time for their unique approach to problem solving. They had a good time arguing about these problems that they were trying to solve with flight. They would argue so vehemently that they would be shouting at one another. One would take one side of a problem and the other would take the other side of the problem and they would argue and argue and then finally at the end they would realize they had switched sides and one would be arguing the side that the other had argued previously. After a while they would generally come to an agreement but by doing this they would really look at every angle, every side of an issue to determine uh, what was truly valuable, necessary, and accurate information. The unusual procedure yielded two inspired suggestions. Orville proposed that they hinge the fixed vertical tail of their glider to make it movable. Wilbur added a new wrinkle. He suggested they link it with pulleys to the wing warping system. With one shift of the hips, the pilot could twist the wings and turn the tail simultaneously. On October 10, 1902, the Wrights were ready to test their revamped glider. Four years of tenacious calculation and painstaking work had boiled down to one critical moment. Wilbur manned the controls. Orville and a Kitty Hawk local aimed the glider directly into the stiff wind. throws his hips over to induce a roll to the right for a coordinated turn. And for the first time in history, we have true flight, ability to turn and completely control a craft in the air. The Wrights flew the revolutionary craft on 375 flights that October, the best lasting 26 seconds. They were able to fly in any wind. They were able to stay in the air for long periods of time. They were able to fly over 600 feet on some of those glides. And they knew they had control of the wind. They had conquered the air uh, in October of 1902. Wilbur and Orville had no time to celebrate. Their most formidable rival, Samuel Langley, was nearing completion of his great aerodrome. He was determined to have a pilot fly it into history. The underdog Wrights had more to worry about than converting their glider into an airplane. They also had to keep a close eye on the clock. In 1903, 
the quest for flight became a great race. As the Wright brothers toiled in anonymity in their Dayton, Ohio workshop, Samuel Langley was making headlines as the overwhelming favorite. With the help of his pilot, Charles Manley, the Smithsonian's eminent leader was gearing up for the maiden flight of his great aerodrome. It was powered by a 52 horsepower engine and sported tandem wings spanning 48 feet. Langley's confidence was supreme. So for all that the Wrights knew, Langley might beat them. They were well aware that he had a very good chance to beat them. They certainly had great respect for his own talents, his own capabilities, but the Wrights were going ahead in their own good way and time. They certainly weren't going to try to fly prematurely just for the sake of trying to win a race. They were going to fly when they were good and ready. Even so, Wilbur and Orville pressed forward with a new sense of urgency. Although they had solved the riddle of aircraft control, they had to unravel a whole new aeronautic puzzle. They needed a light yet powerful engine, effective propellers to produce adequate thrust, and a sturdy new frame to carry the weight and withstand the vibration. The craft the Wrights would call the Whopper Flying Machine would be a fusion of innovative breakthroughs made with unparalleled speed. Wilbur and Orville crafted their own engine with the help of their chief bicycle mechanic, Charlie Taylor. They cast the crankcase from aluminum, which had only become commercially available in the past decade. The rest of the engine was primitive, even by turn of the century standards. It had no fuel pump, carburetor, or spark plugs. Still, it produced 12 horsepower and weighed only 179 pounds. As Taylor made the engine, the Wright struggled with an even greater challenge, the propellers. To that time, flight pioneers had assumed that an aircraft propeller would function much like a ship's, pushing air instead of water backward to drive a plane forward. Months of study convinced Wilbur otherwise. Wilbur's idea that was very different was that a propeller should be a wing on its side traveling in a spiral course and producing lift horizontally or producing thrust. Applying the revolutionary theory, the Wrights carved two spruce propellers, each eight and a half feet in diameter. The Wrights used two propellers for a very specific reason. They had determined that two propellers turning at a lower RPM would act on a greater volume of air and give them the thrust that they required a lot easier, better, and more efficiently than one propeller turning at a higher RPM. They could get by with a less powerful, lighter engine with the two propellers. Fittingly, the Wrights linked their propellers to their engine with a bicycle chain transmission. They twisted one of the drive chains into a figure eight to make the propellers spin in opposite directions. The counter-rotation was a design wrinkle born of their gifted insight. A propeller spinning produces torque, which is a sideways pull on the airframe. If the Wright brothers' propellers had spun in the same direction, then the torque would have tended to turn the airplane to the right or to the left. And so they had the propeller spin in opposite directions to cancel out that torque. It's fascinating to me that this is something that they thought of at that time. Compared to their gliders, the Wright Flyer was massive. The 1902 glider weighed 120 pounds. The Flyer weighed 605. The engine, comprising nearly a third of that weight, was mounted to the right of the pilot. Since it outweighed each of the brothers by 34 pounds, it made the aircraft unbalanced. To compensate, they added four inches to the wing on the heavy side to create more lift. The controls remained unchanged, except for yet another refinement to the wing warping mechanism. In the 1902 glider, the entire wing, both the leading edge and the trailing edge, would flex when they activated the wing warping system. Now on this 1903 flyer, this leading edge was solid. It did not move, it was fixed. The back portion of it, however, the back of the wings, both upper and lower, would flex. Now, as those were connected into the hip cradle, you can see what happens as the wing is warped.
with the twisting motion in the back part of these wings as it was on the 1903 flyer, it's really much the same as what we see on modern aircraft with an aileron. In October 1903, Wilbur and Orville returned to Kitty Hawk. It took several weeks to assemble the flyer and ready it for its critical first flight. They feared they were too late. On December 8th, Langley invited the press to witness the launch of his great aerodrome from a houseboat on the Potomac River. When the aerodrome was catapulted from its launch rail, its rear wings collapsed. The plane plummeted in pieces. The pilot escaped unhurt, but the disaster made Langley a laughingstock. It was an extraordinary moment. If this scientist, a man of international renown, could not successfully develop a flying machine, then the likelihood was no one could. Nine days after Langley's failure, the Wright brothers prepared to fly in the face of conventional wisdom. Since the flyer had no wheels, they built a 60-foot launch rail out of two-by-fours laid end to end. The aircraft skids rested on a small dolly. The Wrights recruited several members of Kitty Hawk's life-saving team to act as their ground crew. They instructed one of them, John Daniels, to stand ready with their camera. A toss of a coin determined that Orville would take the controls. The brothers kind of went off to one side, spoke to each other quietly, and shook each other's hand. And there was a comment by one of the uh, uh, lifesavers that day, and he said, it looked like they were almost saying goodbye like they would never see each other again. At 10.35 a.m., Orville boarded the flyer and the engine was started. The noise was deafening. They can't hear each other talk. They can only communicate by looking at one another and nodding. Orville looks over at Wilbur. Wilbur returns the look. Orville gives the nod. He releases that whole back wire and that craft starts down the rail. The flyer rose gracefully then followed a meandering up and down course as Orville struggled with the elevator. After 120 feet, it darted into the sand. John Daniels was so excited about seeing the aircraft lift off the rail that he wasn't even certain if he had squeezed the shutter bulb to take the photograph. Daniels needn't have worried. Initially, it doesn't look like there's a lot there, but if you really look at that, it's much more detailed then you think, you can see the launching rail, you can see the little dolly that the plane was on, you can see the tools they used that day, a shovel to level the ground, you can see a little grease bucket that they used to, to grease the rail that the plane ran along, a dry cell battery to start the engine. A professional photographer could not have done it any better than John Daniels did that day. And as far as I can determine, that's the only photograph that John Daniels ever took. An hour after their first flight, Wilbur piloted the second, covering 175 feet. Orville flew the third for 200. Then on flight number four that December day, Wilbur kept the flyer aloft 59 seconds, soaring 852 feet. Minutes later, a gust of wind overturned the flyer and sent it hurtling across the sand. The damage was beyond what they could quickly repair it would never fly again. The Wright's unique talents had made flight, humankind's impossible dream, a reality. But their mistrust of others would nearly cost them the credit for it. The Wright's triumph at Kitty Hawk got the young century off to a flying start. But the world was slow to take notice. Only four newspapers carried the story the following day which most people dismissed as exaggerated. The Wrights fueled doubts by refusing to release the photo of their first flight, fearing the competitors would pirate their designs. Wilbur and Orville pressed on, focused more on making improvements than headlines. Though revolutionary, their flyer was an unstable aircraft. Only they could have flown. It still had problems with pitch. By pitch, I mean the up and down controls. Every single flight that day, all four of them, ended with a, a dart toward the ground that 
uh, they couldn't control. It was difficult to control. It had limited range. It had insufficient lift for any sort of sustained flights. And by and large, it was not a practical airplane. So the Wrights were excited by their success, but they knew they had a long road ahead of them and a lot of work to do. No longer dependent on Kitty Hawk's winds, the Wrights shifted their entire operation to Dayton. In secret, they continued their test flying at a remote pasture called Huffman Prairie. Two years of tinkering and two prototypes later, they produced the world's first practical airplane, the Wright Flyer III. The Wrights made three major improvements on this plane over the 1903 Flyer. First, the elevators are a full four feet farther forward than their earlier plane, and the elevators are almost twice as large. This helped with the stability of the aircraft. They also moved the rudder farther to the rear of the aircraft and increased its size, again, aiding the stability of the plane. The Wrights also separated the controls for wing warping and for rudder control. And although this gave the pilot more to do, it made the aircraft much more stable, controllable, and it really helped to make it a practical machine. In 1907, the Wrights developed a new airplane, the Model A. The pilot now sat upright at the controls. To launch it in Dayton's light winds, they constructed a catapult device. A 1,400-pound weight was dropped from the top of a small tower, pulling a line under the guide rail that propelled the craft forward. The Wrights could now stay aloft for as long as a half hour, executing graceful figure eights in total mastery of the sky. But as Wilbur and Orville tried to secure their patents, they suddenly stopped flying. Patent laws at that time said that while the patent was being evaluated, you were not supposed to reveal details of your invention in public. And there was also the concern that somebody else would steal their idea and make money off of it. 1907 was a dark year for the Wrights as they faced the daunting task of selling an airplane that they refused to show to any prospective buyer. The Wright brothers took their design for their plane to the United States Army, and they could not understand why the Army wouldn't buy this without seeing it perform. They had grown up in this household where you believed a person's word, and so that's what they expected of other people. As the Wrights ran into brick walls as salesmen, others began stumbling into the air. In France, renowned balloonist Alberto Santos Dumont flew 200 feet in an ungainly craft that was unable to turn. It smashed its landing gear when it came down, and it cracked its propellers, but there was no denying that the man had flown. And so, as far as anybody in France could understand, he, Santos, was the man who had truly invented the airplane. This had to be a very frustrating time for the Wright brothers because they knew they had a superior airplane. But here, all types of people were getting all types of recognition for inferior aircraft. Wilbur and Orville still refused to fly publicly, insisting to a dubious world that they had long ago conquered the air. The world was calling them fakers. Uh, the French were calling them bluffeurs, or as the French meant it, liars. But there was still that reluctance to do a public demonstration uh, for fear that somebody would steal the idea. By 1908, five years after Kitty Hawk, the Wrights finally secured their patents and two lucrative contracts. They sold a still unproven flyer to the United States government for $25,000 and sealed a deal with a French syndicate for 500,000 francs. On August 8th in Le Mans, France, Wilbur prepared to silence the skeptics. People were probably expecting to see what they had always seen, an airplane do a hop across a field for a few hundred feet or maybe attempt sort of a squirrely fishtail turn. But that's not what happened. He flies on down along his course, and then directly in his path is a grove of trees. And so Wilbur uses his wing warping, and he banks sharply to the left. And the spectators in the grandstand, they start to scream. They think that his plane is out of control. He's going to crash. 
but he now uses his rudder and he sweeps through a successful bank to turn. And the screams from the audience turned to cheers, and they had never ever seen anything like this. Here was flight with power, agility, and precision never even dreamed of. In 1908, this is a miracle. Okay, this is a miracle. And you read tales of women fainting, men crying, all this kind of thing, uh, because that, they, they were saying nothing less than a miracle to them at that time, man flying. A month after Wilbur's triumph at Le Mans, it was Orville's turn. At Fort Myer in Virginia, before awestruck crowds, he demonstrated his flyer for the United States Army. He wowed government officials with low-level acrobatics and masterful endurance flights, lasting as long as 74 minutes. The Wrights had recaptured their glory and their place in history. Fame never changed them, but legal battles with rivals who copied their innovations exhausted Wilbur. In 1912, he contracted typhoid fever and died at age 45. Without his brother, Orville lost his passion to advance flight and sold the fledgling Wright Aircraft Company. For the next three decades, he was content to accept the world's accolades and tinker at his home in Dayton. He died in 1948. Two brothers, whose background belied their brilliance, shaped the century to come more profoundly than presidents or power brokers. At Kitty Hawk, Yankee ingenuity took wing. Some of the brightest and the best, the most well-financed people have been trying to do it. But here's two young men who never went to college, who were self-financed, who operated a bicycle shop, who in a short period of four years succeeded where everybody else had failed. The right story say to us that the common man can succeed. It says the underdog can win. It says that we can do anything that we set our minds to. It's a story that today still convinces us that anything is possible. <laughs>